the one that met with our forefathers, Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. Disconnected them from the world and the society that they were used to. Taught them the language of the spirit and led them to walk by faith. Trusting in the multi-breasted God, the strong and the breasted one. The one that sustains all and is sustained by none. They saw him sustain the first generation, Abraham. He sustained Isaac, sustained Jacob. And in the day of Moses, God now said, I have established my revelation as the El Shaddai in the earth. Abraham walked in it. Isaac walked in it. I gave suck and breast to them. I sustained them. The circumstances around their lives were such that they actually needed one to live on for sustenance. And I was that one. I sustained the first generation. I sustained the second generation. I sustained the third generation. Now that Israel knows me as this, I'm going to change and introduce a new dimension. Now you will know me as Jehovah because I'm about to war. I need to wear a coat for battle. I need to carry out a sword for slaughter. I'm going against my enemies. I want to do. You see, God is, is everything that we need for this spiritual job. He offers himself. And I pray today that, that we will see him in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We will see him. Now, let's just continue directly from where we stopped yesterday. Colossians chapter 2. You must be in love with the Bible. You must be in love with scriptures. <laughs> if we are going to be accurate prophets, then we need to love the Bible. If we want to see Bible results, then we must love the words of scripture. If we want to remain in the cutting edge of accuracy and precision in the spirit, then we must love scripture. Colossians chapter 2, where we stopped yesterday. Amen. Give me back, please. Uh, where's back? I want to announce tomorrow we'll be having a healing night, healing service here. Sick, disease, possessed, oppressed, obsessed people. We are, we are liberty to bring them. Tonight, healing. Um, tomorrow night. Okay, Sunday night. Healing. God will doing wonders in us. Hallelujah. But if he comes down this night, I will allow him. If only we agree that. We need to agree first. <laughs> that if he comes towards my, the closing of my message, we still allow him. But if, we, if there's no agreement, then we'll go. <laughs> Wait till go. Colossians chapter 2. Are you with me? Amen. He's now speaking to us from verse 6. And he says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk ye in him. And I said that there's a column there. If you have King James Version. Then he goes ahead to explain what it means and what we experience when we begin to work with God. When we begin to work with God, something begins to happen. He leads us to a point in the realm where we become rooted in Him. Then He builds us up. And then our life abounds with perpetual thanksgiving. Are you with me now? Are you there? We are what? Rooted. We are what? Built up. And what? We are established in the faith. And what? We are bound unto Thanksgiving. We now discover that in Christ Jesus, I said that anything that is not figured in Christ is not within the context of that which God is doing. If God must do something, he does everything that he does through Christ. All of God's hopes all of his plans are bound on Christ. And outside of Christ, God does nothing. And we need to understand that if we are called to walk by faith, then we must understand that there is an economic and administrative arrangement as to how our faith life will emerge when we are consistent in walking in Christ Jesus. 
When we talk about walking in Christ Jesus, I'm talking about a quest, an adventure that begins when we begin to desire to know God. Now, a lot of guys want to know how to prosper. They want to know how to get stuff from God, but they don't want to know God. That's people that go to a shrine for miracles. That's the same mindset that they have. They want to receive a blessing. They want to receive something that will change their condition and their status. But they don't want to know the spirit that the man they are going to consult is communicating with, that is producing the miracle. And we have become people like that. That want the things that God can produce, but who don't want to get deep within God so that God can begin to function the way He functions through other people through us. And so the, with the average Christian lives on a shallow plane of divine experience and his life cannot command deliverances unto Jacob. So many meetings, there are so many ba ba banners displayed, posters out there. Every time Christians in Makodi are busy attending one program or the other, but in final analysis, after 12 years, you are still a baby, you don't know. It means that we have a devised a, a pathway toward God that is not consistent with the pathway that the apostles walked. And that's why we, 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 are, we are always learning but never coming to maturity. Always being taught but never learning how to use the instrument that knows how to design the navigations that takes place in the realm of the spirit. But God is about to crystallize a church. A group of people that, that, that know God. And everything changes when a man gets to know God. And so our call into God, the first moment you give your life to Christ, is a call to explore God through Christ. It's just like as astronauts explore space. We are called to explore God. And the, the medium of our adventure and sojourning is Christ. So the Bible says, now that you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye with him. Until you become rooted, until you become built up, until you become established in the faith. And when these three things characterize your experience, you will be abounding upon your Christ. Notice that Jesus said that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. And the apostolic ministry was configured with that recipe in mind. And that's why the focus of the apostolic ministry was to establish, to lay the foundation of Christ and establish the believers in Christ. Because if they are established that way, the gate of hell may attempt but not prevail. Because the church will be strong, fortified, like, 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 a, like a city with iron gates and walls. And the, the darkness will not be able to pierce through because the foundation and the superstructure are all figured in God. The least among us can become strong in God if we know how to navigate God through Christ. As I said yesterday, I don't believe that there is an extra grace that I have to hear God. I don't have any grace to hear God that any natural, normal believer doesn't have. But the difference between you and me may be the extent to which we have explored Christ. Because when you explore Christ, there's a residue and a testimony for your journey. God leaves grace behind. There's grace that he deposits upon your life. As a testimony that you do business in great waters. And as you walk that walk, and as you do that journey, even you yourself, you are changed. Hallelujah. You don't need to control anything. It's part of the package. Just walk with God. And everything that you need for life and for godliness will begin to navigate in your direction. In, in talking further about walking in Christ, we stumbled upon Romans chapter 8 yesterday, for the Bible says, Now there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, you see, he's teaching us something here. That in order for you to get to understand God through your walk with him, you must learn how to walk in the spirit. Because the dividends and the, the strength and the virtue that is in God that is being transmitted to Christ is not transmitted in form of flesh, it's transmitted in form of spirit. Amen? And also, if you are going to have compatibility with the devil, 
then you must sustain a regular operation that is figured in the flesh. If you have mastered how to walk in the spirit and you give no vocation to the flesh, more and more the devil becomes an inconsequential entity around your life. And you don't need to do any prayers for that to happen. That you are living in the spirit is enough exit notice and quick notice to, to the devil. More and more you will not be seeing the devil around your life. More and more, even in your prayers, you will not be seeing the devil. More and more, you... Oh my God, but the mighty consciousness of God, his economy, the world of angels, and the, the dynamics of the spirit become what you are conscious of. All of these things came about just by a walk with God. Just a walk with God. And so the Bible said that we need to master something. You know, a few days ago, my son started walking. And sometimes, you know, as he's trying to gain stability and trying to master the center of gravity as it moves on his two legs. Sometimes he wants to walk. He walks faster than normal. Some other times he will walk slower than normal. He has not yet gained mastery. And when you come into God, many times you walk in the spirit sometimes and you move in the flesh sometimes. And you walk in the spirit sometimes. You prophesy sometimes. And then you fight by the roundabout. And then you come and heal the sick. And you, you stab somebody in Uruku. You, there is a And there is a strong contradiction. In the book of Romans 5, 5, Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8, there is a comparison. And there is a comparison. Romans 5 reveals to us that uh, what, what becomes our destiny in Adam. Romans 6 reveals to us what is our destiny in Christ. Romans 7 reveals to us our destiny in the flesh. Romans 8 reveals to us our destiny in the spirit. And then you come to realize what Paul was trying to do. That Christ is compatible with the spirit. While the flesh is compatible with Adam. So when you begin to operate in the flesh, you are living out the destiny of Adam. If you operate in the spirit, you are living out the destiny of Christ. The Bible says, now there is therefore no condemnation. For those who are figured in Christ. And have decided and, 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 and determined to walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Somebody tell your neighbor, walk in the spirit. The other time somebody looked upon you and insulted you, you felt like rescuing, redeeming your image and restoring your masculinity before the audience. It was the flesh. Because the flesh will always try to suggest to you that there's something you can, you can gain if you, if you walk by it. Meanwhile, in the spiritual journey, experienced men have already judged the spiritual life and revealed to us that the flesh profited nothing. Just in case you felt like releasing a slap to make a point, the flesh profited what? Nothing. Just in case you felt like doing something bad and keeping the heart so that when the time comes, I will strike. The flesh profited nothing. It has already been judged and spiritual men have given us a reference. You don't need to prove it with your life anymore. So when you begin to walk in the spirit, there are temptations for you to glide out in the flesh. Somebody gave me slide to Christ was a strong occultic man. He had charms and all of that. And the discipleship process began. One day he busted out the new tears. He said, Pastor, you won't make me woman. Hey. Ah. You won't make me woman. So you mean that when these people come now, I can strike back. Ah. You won't make me woman. Friends, I need to tell you something. <laughs> In the spirit you attain to your greatest potential. But in the flesh you attain to your least potential. What do you think you can do by just your small fist? Meanwhile he has called us to overtake nations. To bring his fingerprint upon lands. Upon territories, kingdoms. To break the backbone of the devil. To release the destiny of nations. Release the destiny of the tribes. Of how can you do that with the flesh profited nothing? And so you need to master how to walk in the spirit. Amen? That means anytime you walk in the flesh and the Holy Spirit gives you a signal, you repent. Say, no, this is not my destiny. I'm sorry. I, I went out of you. Try to use my resources to make up for what I felt was a loss. Because I was not patient enough to receive strength from you. Hallelujah. And you come back and ask him for grace. The next time those things happen again, you will find out that you have control of yourself and you don't walk in the flesh again. It means you have, you have moved a step ahead. Like my son. You have moved a step ahead. 
Are you with me? And then suddenly, you now discover that anytime you see money, you must steal. Then you now come to God and say, God, I'm already taking Bible study, but this infirmity is still here. Hallelujah. You receive grace and say, Lord, can you help me out of this? And suddenly you see money, you don't have any means you're overcoming the flesh. And you're being more tuned to spirit life. Being more tuned to spirit life. Being more tuned to spirit life. The truth is that the call of the prophet is to be more normal in the spirit realm than in the natural realm. That's our call. To be more normal to operate on the pedestals of the spirit than in the flesh. And anytime you find yourself difficult in the flesh, your whole system go crashes because you are not used to it. That is a testimony of the fact that you are now rooted in Christ. You have no confidence. I said that when you begin to walk in the spirit, 70% of God's speakings is not in words. Tell your neighbor, please. 70% of the speakings of God is not in words. These I have designed by experience. Amen? I can prove it by the Bible if you give me time. Show you that if God communicated here, no words. No words, no words, no words. Then now, if communicated what? One. You see, communicated three times. Then use the words once, seven times, once, twelve times, not, no time. Then we can form a chart. Then you see, most of the time, it doesn't use words. As we begin to walk in the spirit realm, this is where faith comes. God transmits by, first of all, sending signs. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, signs. About to board a bus to go to Joss, my friend was about to wear. And he kept calling me, called me three times and said, If you don't come to that wedding, then you are wrong. Amen. So I was in the office, I closed, came to town, dressed up, and I had to board one of the buses to go. And as I just paid, I just put my leg in the bus. My peace left. <laughs> that means God is saying, I'm not with you on this journey. Well, you can decide to go. You have already paid the fare. But all he did was to give me a sign. I'm not with you. Hallelujah. Many times the difference between life and death has always been a sign. We do not understand that when great things move in the realm of the spirit, sometimes it is not it. In order for God to keep his oath of secrecy, he communicates in a certain way that the devil cannot discern. He gives you a sign. A sign that is, is something that is an intimate um, communication hallmark between you and him. And the devil has no knowledge of. And suddenly he switches off his channel of peace to your soul. And you feel no peace. It means that it's death. You feel no sense of life. It means there is chaos. Signs. See, if God can as much as give you a sign, it means he loves you. And a man of faith does not ignore even the smallest among the sun. He lies about himself seven times to the earth. And each time he sent his seven gihas to check the sky to see the product of his prayers. He was betting something in the spirit. And God had revealed to him that the impact of what he was betting was going to find a reflection in the sky. And when he, he, he bowed his head, he told gihas, go check the sky. He said, my God, the Hamatan son I tried everything. There's no cloud. So all right, he went back and he six times go check. No. Seven times check. Well, it's not, but just that I saw a cloud. Insignificant. Just fashion and free. After the hand of a man, God was giving what? A sign. A sign is that which points to something. It was Jesus that said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is among men. A sign does not point to itself, but it points to something. And several times when you begin to navigate in the realm of the spirit, what God does as a testimony, what God does in, in response to your navigation, your adventure, is that he, he makes you conscious of, just like I said yesterday, 
when you as much as receive a sign and you are responsible, you want to find out the meaning. And it is when you have fellowship with God on several signs that you know the meaning the moment he drops it. Like when it has happened once, it has happened one another time, when it happens to you, you will know the meaning. You get it? There is a way I feel if danger is going to come. I'm talking about a danger that prayer cannot stop. God has said that it must come. This, there's a way I feel. As if something, and it, it may be peculiar to me, so I won't describe it. I feel that way. And, and I know that even if I pray, that the danger will still come. We were praying for a crusade, we prayed for about six months. Is that not enough time to have prayed? Six months intensive prayers, night vigils, we were on the field in Kano, speaking in tongues wild. Two days to the crusade, when I held our hands and began to pray, pray for, for some hours. And I felt that way. Ah, uh, I told my friends, I said, friends, there's danger. Our prayers cannot stop. But our prayers will reduce it. So let's reduce it. But it must come. I had known that sign. Because the first time that sign came to me, I prayed like, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. It still happened. Second time, I prayed, I prayed. It still happened. And anytime time I feel that way, I know it will happen. Not because it was an audible communication. Not because it was an articulate communication. It was what? Sir. Are you with me now? So I told my friends, I said, friends, danger is on the way. But because we prayed, God is going to reduce it. In Kano, for the crusade that we organized, we rented the best equipment that there is, that there is on rent in Kano. Best equipment for that crusade. And um, um, when we finished the crusade in the night, we plug out the instruments and somebody uh, decided to help us house them in his house. Close to the crusade. Now. And he was living in a block of flats. You know, have you ever been to the police barracks? You know, their houses connected together. Okay. So he was living in the third block. And after the first night of the crusade, we were going home rejoicing because of the things that God did. In the crusade ground. And that night, the guy in the first block was using a candle in the night. And he, he wanted to enjoy his sleep. So he stretched his bones. He stretched his feet. And he, he fellowship with a candle. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And gradually the house began to burn. Before the guy realized he was deep in slumber. By the time he realized, when he was choked by the smoke, the, the fire had already entered into the city. The best he could do was to come out alive. Because any, any attempt <laughs> to try to rescue anything will mean that he may not, the TV might be saved, but he might, he might die. But he was smart enough to rescue himself. And the fire burnt his own house and burnt everything in his house and cut, went into the next house and burnt everything there. And the dead house, the equipment that we had hired for, so much money was there. And when we were telling the guy that wanted to keep the equipment every night, he said, he warned us doing like this. <laughs> that means if anything happens to it, you pay. We, we were even in debt. As we were preaching, we were in debt. So if the debt of <laughs> that equipment... <laughs> Some of us will. And we didn't have money anywhere. Like me, the father would have taken me to jail and the money wouldn't have come because there was no money. Hallelujah. And the fire burned the second house. And then when he got to the third house, he stopped. The third house was the house that our equipment was in. That sign I received means that the thing will happen, oh, but your prayer will not stop it from happening, but to it is to it to reduce the damage. When the prayer got to the third house, it stopped. But that signal came to me through the sign. In scriptures, there were several people, several prophets that required a sign from Jesus. I don't want to go in, I don't want to stretch it too much, okay? You know what it means, so no need to join it again. As if we are preaching signs, it's not sign we are preaching. Amen. 
Secondly, as you move in the spirit realm, and as you journey with God, you'll be receiving signals. Have you ever switched on your radio? And you try browsing through, uh, using the knob, the inter-switch knob, and you didn't get any station. But when you uh, put up your, your antenna, you were able to get some signal. See, you need to be active in the spirit for you to be able to receive a signal. See, if you are really operating under the authority of God, the way you relate with people, the way you relate with money, the way you relate with things, the way you operate in your office, God will hold you accountable for every action in your life. And so when you come and just insult people just because you are their superior in the office, a signal will come. It's not, it's not an articulate form of communication, but God will tell you, I'm displeased with that communication. And if you are responsible, you will go back and make peace. And then maybe somebody else might say, hey, why did you go back? Was it not that person that was doing this and doing that and doing that and doing that? Why did you belittle yourself like this? The person cannot understand why. You responded that way because of faith. God gave you a signal and you were true to that signal. Do you understand it? Now, you cannot isolate faith from our walk in God. From our exploring God. From our exploring God in Christ Jesus. I said just as astronauts explore space, that's how we are called to explore God. The walk of faith is a life. That's how the life of the Spirit is configured. That's how oppression in the Spirit is. And if you fellowship in the Spirit, and you walk in the Spirit, and insist that your life should be figured in the Spirit, you will understand these signals. It's part and parcel of the life of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody offended me one time. I didn't do nothing. I held my peace. And then, in the place of prayer, God now said that I should go and release the offenders. I died. I died. I didn't do nothing. The person kept. Do you understand? Went up. Okay, let me tell you the origin. When I came to Kano, I, I started attending a, a fellowship. And the Bible study teacher was a Ghanaian. Okay? And the guy was to travel to Abuja. So the man said, As you travel to Abuja, this copper will be teaching us. So he came to me and said, Please, will, will you teach the fellowship? I said, no problem. Then I opened the scripture. When we entered the scripture that night, they said, tomorrow we are coming to open for us. We opened that night. Then I saw that if the fellowship was an orthodox fellowship, they, they were not speaking in tongues. I opened the Bible and spoke about Holy Ghost baptism. And we said, do the day for, for impartation. Oh my God. And people spoke in diverse tongues. It was an equa community. And after that one happened, the, the parents of, of the people in the youth fellowship now said, who is that copper that came and has given their son, their, their children, language to speak? Straight language. <laughs> and it, it became something else. It became, they were about to pick me. I said, God, I, you know, my father is not here. My father is not here. I'm the only one here. I just came here to serve my nation. And, and the so I went to the mountain top and I quenched the 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 sky from there. I quenched it and I came down. Hallelujah. When the Ghanaian Bible study teacher came back, he left an other fellowship. He came and met a Pentecostal one, speaking in tongues of fire. And he left for only two weeks. And, and the fellowship became so wild that we could pray four hours in, 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 in tongues. We became so wild that four hours prayer could not satisfy us again. We, we now consecrated Saturday, day of prayer, from 8 o'clock to 4 p.m. in the evening, every Saturday. When the guy came, and then I now handed over to him, he mounted the, the podium and taught the Bible that night. They said, uh, Teacher. You might need to hear this copper. Sit down. Hear the copper. 
So the guy now, from that point, he became a mortal enemy. Started going, doing all kinds of things. See, visions one day, I just finished teaching the Bible, and the Holy Ghost was there. He came like a prophet. He came from the sky. And he's, he said, I saw Israel scattered upon the mountains. I saw Israel scattered. Like sheep without a shepherd. I saw Israel. Oh, when he finished prophesying, he now put his hand in the pocket. And he, he, the Lord gave you understanding. <laughs> And when I, I was born, I died because I, I was a mafia. I was a mafia. I, I, when I gave my life to Christ, I left the ways of the mafia. But that day I was tempted to try out my legs in the taekwondo skis I used to learn. Jehovah said, no, that's not how we do it. I died. I died that time. Hallelujah. I died. Before I, I'll come back from work, the guy has gone to every house. They are story, there's a new story every day. A new story. He, he. Hallelujah. He went and said, oh my God. And I went to God. And the God said, when you go in public, shake him. I say, this one, I mean, it's not in the Bible. So, <laughs> the flesh was struggling, was fighting, was fighting. And that day, I had to close my eyes to shake him in the public. But when I did that, I was promoted in the spirit. Peace flooded my heart. And from that day, I received immunity. Anything the guy did, didn't touch me. I now discovered that the Lord, even though the devil was using him, but the Lord allowed it so that he could heal me on this. When God finished, when he outlived his usefulness, then he put a curse upon me. Many years later, I was already in Abuja. And one day I woke up in the parlor. I saw the guy kneeling down. I said, Ernest, what are you doing? He said, there's a curse. Only you can break it. I said, I, I, I didn't curse you. It was it. <laughs> I didn't cause it. And I hugged, I knelt down with him and hugged him and cried. And released him. And then life came back again. He said, there's therefore no condemnation. To them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh. But after the spirit. Are you with me now? Thirdly, in the spirit, there's also a language that God speaks. It's a language of symbols. Job chapter 12. Let me show you. Before we begin to navigate. Sometimes when God really gets ready to talk, He begins to use symbols. In Job chapter 33, turn with me. Are you there now? I need to give you the background of the book of Job so that you understand what is happening in verse 33. If you read your Bible very well in the book of Job, you'll find out that the Bible revealed that Job was the greatest man in the East. Amen? That is a very deep revelation. Because Job also had three friends. Amen? I call them the three cardinals. Because Job himself was, was a cardinal. He was a cardinal of the east. The cardinal of the north, south, and west were the other three friends. They were the strongest philosophers within their territories. Job was the custodian of wisdom within his own territory. And the other cardinals came because they heard that one of the men in their order and in their ranking was afflicted. And they wanted to explain through their deep philosophy why Job was afflicted. Hallelujah. And everyone came with his own philosophy. We can't go into details about the, their 
various philosophies and how they try to explain Job's situation from the standpoint of their own perspective. But all of them were wrong. And then suddenly, when we got, got to the book of Job chapter 32, we now saw that one of the cardinals came with his with help boy. His name was Elihu. After all the cardinals exhausted their, their explanation of Job's situation and they could not discomfit Job because they were not operating from the standpoint of accuracy, then suddenly there was silence. It was like an equalizer. It was like a stalemate if you... Have you played chess before? And there's a stalemate. And then there was silence. And then in verse 32 or chapter 32, Elihu now stood. And he said that I thought that ye should speak and length of days should teach wisdom. I thought that wisdom was with great hair, gray hair. So I humbled myself in your company and I did not want to contribute. But you see, I was under the strain and the stress of the Holy Ghost. I realized that there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty gave them understanding. Oh, God began to brood over my spirit when I heard your philosophy. And nobody could bring the accurate point and perspective. But you see, it was not mine to speak because the elders were conferring in deep matters of wisdom. But the Spirit of God moved over me and granted me insight. Not by my age, but by the Spirit I know these things. And then he began to speak. He spoke and gave us a lot of characteristics of how God speaks. And then he moved into Job chapter 33. And then he was now analyzing the situation. In the book of George chapter 33, verse 12, he said, God is greater than man. Why did he bring or make this thing? We'll find it. Are you with me now? Job 33, verse 12, as we go on. Job 33, verse 12. Behold, in this thou are not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. The first sign that he gives us to confirm the fact that God is greater than man is that God does not see any need to explain himself when people don't understand him. You see, many, many times like that, if people don't understand you, you feel under pressure to come explain yourself. The reason why I did not do this is because of that. The reason why I did not do that is because of this. But God does not feel under pressure to explain himself to anybody, even when they misunderstand him. The Bible says he doesn't give account of his matters. He doesn't feel as insecure as to want to give explanation to people that do not perceive him well. Amen? One point. I don't want to stress that point. That's not where I'm going. Second point. Fourteen. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceived it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep fell upon men in the slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and select their instruction. Number two, reason why God is greater than man is that God can give you a dream and yet withhold the understanding of the dream from you. He has come so close to you. Open your eyes. You say you saw this, you saw that, you saw this. You saw that. What's the meaning of this and that? What he was trying to make the cardinals understand that you guys are strong in philosophy. But God has withheld the true cause of Job's picture from you. God is greater than you. You see, but me, I want to capture something from that. That when God communicates, he said that in the dream of, of, of the night, God shows us things. It's one thing for God to show you stuff and it's another thing for God to give you the understanding of that which I showed you. 
So most of God's communications are in pictures. That's what I'm trying to draw from that scripture. He uses symbols. He likes communicating in pictures. And if you go stay long enough with God, you receive some pictures from him. And the reason why he brings those pictures your way is not to, it's not because he has an album that is flipping through. He's giving you some information that will arm you. Hallelujah. But you see, he wants your fellowship. He wants you to come into him. And so he gives you a picture and he seal it up the understanding. If you are reasonable, what will you do? You will seek. But you don't get it. See, God is the father of all spirits. If he wants to communicate to you, there's no way he will not reach you. He has the address to your spirit. Just like if you have people's email address, you can send them mails. God knows how to reach you. Whether you are born again or not, he's the one that configured your spirit. He can, he can encounter you. He can give you a picture that will overwhelm your mind and will change your direction. And when God, when you begin to navigate in the spirit, you begin to get some pictures. You see, from signs to signals to what? Pictures or symbols. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, we see John in the Isle of Patmos. And in the Isle of Patmos, he said that he saw seven golden candlesticks and seven stars. If not that Jesus interpreted those symbols, who would have imagined that it was a thousand and one things. But Jesus was the one that came and said that the stars symbolized the angels of the churches. And the what? The seven golden candlesticks symbolized what? The seven churches. He likes picking and showing men pictures. He likes doing that. And in the spirit as you navigate, you begin to find him giving you snapshots. Pictures. Things that will overwhelm your mind. Things that will make you stop and think. All he's trying to do is call you into the closet. Call you to come closer. Call you. You are going far. And he's trying to reach out to you. That's why he sealed up the understanding. And if you are responsible, you want to what? Find out. Do you realize that when Daniel set his heart to understand, angels began to come. Things began to happen. The reason why you have not grown in the prophetic, grown in, in, in receiving communication from God is because you have not set your heart to understand. God shows you stuff, but you don't set your heart. You don't make a business. You don't set your face. I said, all right, I must know this thing. No matter what, it, if you set your heart, he will reveal it to you. Do you see that? And so our walking in the spirit is characterized with with different planes of communication that God brings our way. And then when you get to understand the full message behind the communication and you believe in it, because you are sealed to operating in the spirit. Are you with me now? Oh my God, you are not here. Are you here? Because you are tuned to operating in the spirit, when you begin to decode this communication that God is bringing your way, you don't have an assurance. When you decode it, it is imparted upon your heart with a depth of assurance that makes it authentic. And you know that this cannot be fake because it is alive and it's burning inside of your heart. And you know that with that testimony, with that which you have conceived, with that which you are pregnant with, very soon, very soon, even though nobody can see it, it is real to you. And very soon it will become real to many people. That's how faith begins. When you begin to learn how to walk in Christ and to understand his communication. Because faith begins when we get to understand God's communication. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I took my time to find out what word in that scripture meant. And it meant rhema or revelation. The proceeding word of God. Not the one he has written. But the one he's saying now. That is what faith is based upon. Are you saying with me now? Is based on the revelation. And if faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it means that the place where faith is born is the place of prayer. Because that's where we all have a mystery. That's where you speak to God. The only thing is that God will not speak to you in a way different from what the Bible can confirm. You get it? But faith is mostly born in the place of prayer. Not much more than in the place of study. Much more than in the place of study. Faith is born in the place of prayer. Because faith is established upon the speaking of God. 
direct speaking of God, direct discernment of the communication of God, and a lot in the economy of God depends upon His communicating with you. That's why faith is needful. The reason why the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God is because you, you see, when God communicates to you, okay, let me show you something. Kai, oh, I can't. I, this, this. You take us too long to get to those places. Amen? Too long. So there's communication in the realm. And the Bible says that now that you are born again, your next task is to what? Walk in Christ. And walking in Christ means walking in the spirit. Understanding the communication that is coming to you in your spirit. Understanding the signs. Understanding the signals. Understanding the symbols. And understanding the voice of God. Amen. And do you know, the first time I heard God, I did not doubt that it was God. You have never heard God before. And then you heard God for the first time. And you didn't go to your Bible study teacher to say, I heard something you just knew. How did you know? Did you control anything to know? Inside of the operation of faith is a resident discernment for you to know God's communication. Inside of you. It's, in, it's, it's inbuilt in your spirit. That's why God created you in your image. So that you have the capacity to understand his communication. It will be natural for you to hear God. And faith is born when you hear God. When I now discover that I could hear God, I said, alright, my problems are solved. Because if my God can talk, if God can speak, then it means that anything that I'm going through, I'll go to God for it. And God will talk about it. Amen? People that don't like the place of prayer don't get to understand how God operates. The place of prayer is a cardinal place. Anything that takes you away from the place of prayer is an attack on the enemy. It's an attack on your anointing. It's an attack on your life. Hallelujah. It's an attack. When I'm back to the house that I'm living in now, and then we wanted to dedicate the house. And normally we do that with three days night vigil. It's just in case something was planted there, we neutralize. Just in case a witch is close there, we send a message. You, you, I'm, I'm in charge now. Just in case a necromancer does some things in the night, we'll send, we'll send a signal. You, you, you may die in the process. Your next flight might be your last flight. Then suddenly after one day night vigil, the neighbors came out and said, you were disturbing us. We said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The next night we prayed louder. You better get used to it. Better get used to it. I paid rent here. Jesus. I paid my rent in full. Not only the landlord. And I also paid for the ability to speak loud in the night. Anything that attacks your prayer life is from the pit of hell. That is a bedrock that vitalizes the operation of Christ. And when the operation of Christ in your spirit is going low, your perception of God will be low. And then the devil will be, will have a few days. Spoke loud at the second night. They didn't come after the second night. We spoke loud the third night again. And they didn't come. And then we now say, okay, please come to our house. We have night meeting. And we prayed like that for long until they get Then I went to preach in the north, and then one woman came to visit and came to the parlor and sat down. I was doing like this. I said, ah, I saw her in the realm. She's a witch. We are, it is good to have neighbors that are witches. <laughs> she was doing the leg like this. They said, Where's Pastor? Where's Pastor? He went to preach. May we know your name and why you came? It's okay. It's okay. We have seen a lot of that. It's beggarly and weak. If you want to fight, you know where we are. <laughs> if you come there and you go back alive, it means God was merciful. Hey. <laughs> One small witch at the neighborhood causing problem arise and blot out many fires in the spirit. And then very soon they will begin to greet you. Laugh here, Zaki. <laughs> I, don't, I don't 
don't care where you have come from, what you do. But this is my life. I pray in the night. I communicate with God. Sometimes I'm led to shout. And when I do so, I shout very well. Anything that can break into your, your prayer life is, is affecting your very essence. Jesus goes out for crusades. He, he, he becomes back tired. And the Bible says in, the, in, in, in a great while before day, he goes into a solitary place and prays. With the weakness on his body. Because he knows that prayer is a vital part of life. To make him connect with heaven. And to stay connected. So that he can bring the dividends of heaven into the earth realm. He was a man of the spirit. Whose life was figured in the spirit. And in him the flesh profited. And so you begin to see that faith will become a natural thing that you do. If you are consistent in your work with God. And in the place of prayer. When I studied the apostolic template for ministry, they, 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 the two constants in their ministry, every other thing was a variable, was that they had to pray and they had to fellowship over the apostles' doctrine. Constant. Four-point agenda. Amen? And the people were growing in God. They didn't have as much programs as we have today. Morning posters, many handbills. Was littering the city. And no, no, no. They just had four-point agenda. Praying. The, the, the fellowship broke over the apostles' doctrine. They, 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 they broke bread together. Hallelujah. That was it. When the devil wanted to attack them, he wanted to make the apostles with all the anointing they have to begin to serve tables. Meet needs. Just meet needs. You build the anointing just to meet people's needs. Build the anointing just to give people miracles. And then you have, meet, you have been diverted by the devil. If our ministry does not raise people that eventually become Christ-like in the full measure of, of their call upon the face of the earth to, to stand as a resistance against the advancement of the enemy and to bring forth the dominating dimension of kingdom advance. What we have done is not more than economics. It's weak and wicked. Marginalize is the destiny of many people. Put them in, into slavery. But I, I tell you today, liberty comes. Even to this land, liberty comes. Death. See, the, the, the falsehood will die in natural death. Because if every Christian were an authentic Christian, would have driven darkness out of this land a long time. But it's not too late. It's not too late. Satan, your time is up. Oh my God, men that know the voice of their father. Men that know how to navigate in the spirit. Nothing shall escape them. Nothing. Amen. So in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, John there, I'll end there. Let your confidence in the Lord become strong. He is not a man that he should lie. Not the son of man that he should repent. Hallelujah. Guess what happened? After a series of night vigils, one day we were cutting the grass outside the house and a neighbor of mine just came and said, Pastor. I never introduced myself to be pastor. <laughs> Do you know that there are some things that can come out of your life people just say, Pastor, you know it's the wrong kind of thinking. That's the normal things that believers do. And if your life does not command such deliverance, it means your life is abnormal or subnormal. It's not for pastors. There's no special grace that a pastor walks in which is not available in Christ in order to fund your own destiny and life. You are placed in the unique graces of his call because he has a call. And that grace sustains him in the call and in his life in God. And the grace you have will sustain you in your own call and in your own life in God. Do you understand that? It's not exclusive for pastor. Pastor. Say, what, what's that? Say, a spirit used to come to our compound in the night. But since this your prayer started, we have been sleeping. The spirit has gone. I said, oh, the spirit has gone. We didn't say that spirit should go. What, what did we say? We said, Lord, we have come. And our coming means the going of what? Of spirit. So we are not even aware that spirits were living. But we are just doing our own business. Do you understand it? We walk in deliverance. As you go around, things break. Things scatter. Things break. People get loose and free. Just because 
a man that works in God came out. And it's not exclusive to preachers. I believe that God will come upon your spirit. That he will move so strong upon your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Paul was operating under the influence of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I'll prove it. Alright? Because he began to speak and began to give definition to some very complex spiritual things. He said, in my experience with God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation visited me. And he revealed to me what faith is. He was the one that defined I said, now, faith is. Notice that he was not the first man that walked in faith. Because he gave examples of people that walked in faith even before his ancestors were born. He gave examples of Abraham. Gave examples of Abel. Gave of Noah. Gave of what? Enoch. People that existed many years. He operated in the same thing. But it was in the day of Paul that God brought the revelation of what faith was. So it, you, you may not know something spiritually, know it, all right? But you are walking in it. But you, it's not revealed to you. Right? You get it? And then when you begin to read a book, somebody that has received the spirit of wisdom and revelation now reviews your experience and then gives it a name. Oh! Because, you see, in spiritual things, many times, you go along without your mind. If you are going to walk in the spirit, your heart will take the lead. But if you are going to walk in the flesh, your mind will take the lead. You get it? You want to think it out, calculate it. Use your Japanese calculator. Find the average, the mean, the median, the mode. Before you set your feet and then test it. For the man of faith. Haven't received conviction from the Holy Spirit. He, he walks, he runs on water. And then the canal man will be saying, <laughs> You will do the impossible. <laughs> what has not been done in your clan, <laughs> your life will produce that pattern in the name of Jesus Christ. It was Paul that received, operating under the spirit of wisdom and revelation, now said, Now, faith is. The substance of things hoped for. People have operated in that realm before. But God wanted to use Paul to give us insight. To label it. So that we can even understand it in our mind. Alright? Even though faith is not born from the mind. But by the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He wanted to bring us to a point where we can even know what it is in our mind. Alright? So now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtain what? A good hope. Through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. And that the things that are seen were not made by the things which do appear. Simple. Come with me. I wanted to leave that one for another time. Those two verses. They are very deep. Well, let's look at a few things. And then we close. Because if you are working with faith, there must be a testimony. Something that your life is going to produce that you cannot produce it naturally. So you have seen that it is an element and a precursor of our work with God. It is imparted by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because Paul, in his definition of faith, said it is a substance of things hoped for. And if you know what hope is, hope is something that is blind, that is seeking. Just like a blind man that stretches forth his hand and is looking for a cup. Amen? And if he comes and takes a hold of this mic stand and he senses it with his hand and it doesn't seem like how a cup should feel, his search still continues. You get it? Until he comes to a place where he feels the dimensions of a cup and then his hope receives substance. You get it? We are praying and say, God, because through faith you are able to interact with the invisible creation. The Bible reveals to us that there is visible creation. 
Let's him be in smoke race. But the Bible said, through faith, we understand that the world was framed by the word of God. And that things that are seen were not made by things that do appear. So there are things that cannot appear. And those things that cannot appear are superior to the things that you can see and touch and know. And that's why the oppression of a herbalist, man that understands the interactions of the spirit, is all he can always bring a professor that has studied in Harvard and make him mad, influence him, because he operates from a realm that is superior to the realm that the professor has mastered. Amen. You see, when you go around preaching the gospel, you will see some people that are more educated in darkness than we are educated in light. Have you seen anybody like that? And even though people go to church around there, somehow they acknowledge that man as an entity. Amen? He will go back to those places. We don't need to send Rehan Bonke. We don't need to send Benny Hill there. God is going to release you there. And a time will come where that man too will know that the power came into the territory. He has not figured it out yet. But at least he's, he's wise enough to know that if he collides with it, he may not survive. I trust God that you will, you will, you will release that thunderbolt, that volcano that is looming on your inside. He will give you the grace to let it loose in the name of Jesus Christ. So Paul begins to give us insight. He says... By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And that the things that we see were not made by things that do appear. So faith actually gives you connection to the invisible creation. It makes you relate with God. His spirit. Amen. It makes you to be able to fellowship in a, in a conglomerate where angels are present. Do you understand it? It makes you to operate beyond the natural. And if you operate that way, your life is going to com command a dimension that is beyond the natural man. And there will be a report that your life will present. Are you with me now? If it is true that we understand that realm, and we fellowship in that realm, and the Bible says that faith is that substance, that the Holy Spirit furnishes and imparts upon your heart as a proof that something that you have not seen with your eyes actually exists. Amen. So the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God. How do you come to God? God is not in the tangible realm. He that cometh to God. If you want to approach unto God, the only way you can do such an approaching is that you acknowledge his existence. And that acknowledgement is a function of it. And you rejoice. You begin to rejoice. You that were crying, you were just crying now. Now when you begin to rejoice, somebody peep it through the windows. This is a bad man. He's crying now. And I know nothing has happened. Now he's rejoicing. He has wiped his eye. Why? Something has been furnished in his spirit. Something has been furnished in his heart. And he doesn't need to see it with his eyes. Because that which has been furnished is a testimony. That that which he was seeking has become real in the realm of the spirit. It is when we function that way. That you'll be able to know that there's an angel here. It's when we function that way. That you'll be able to know that even now you can be healed. It's when we function that way. That you go to a place. And you receive witness of the Holy Spirit. That there's a satanic groove around here. You have not seen it. But you know that it's true. Because that word. That voice that speaks never lies. Hallelujah. Somebody was paralyzed in Canada. And he insisted that we have to follow him to his village to pray for him. And his village have to be, happened to be in Plateau State. When the team that went to pray for him got to Plateau State in his village, somewhere near Lantan, in prayer, God revealed, say, put salt inside of water and sprinkle it on the ground. You know, it's, it looks like madness. The way of God is strange. Many times it leaves your mind behind. Your understanding being unfruitful. You might question it, but a man of faith knows, knows better. That in the flesh we attain to our least potential. But in the spirit we attain to our greatest potential. Amen? That was the instruction. Put salt in water. Piam, piam. 
and unknown to us. The man that was sick, a, a, a ram was buried alive in that compound. Do you understand? Buried alive. And as the ram was rotting, so the man was rotting. Then the Lord said, put salt in water. Sprinkle around the compound. And the necromancers are the enchanters that tied that man were watching. And when that one was done in the evening time, overnight, the place in the covenant where they hung the man's spirit, his spirit was loose. And his spirit entered his body again. That man's his tongue was cut as if they used razor to cut the tongue. When the spirit entered, his tongue was healed, literally healed. And where the team were camping, the man came in the morning. He knocked the door and said, your God is real, your God is real. And the man drove his car, started driving. Somebody that was paranoid. And then it became easier for the community to believe now that they saw a sign. Because every true work of faith always produces what? A testing. So okay, the work has not finished. Now that this man has been healed, the next thing that will happen is that the person that attacked him will, will die in his place. Well done, well done. And then the team left the village. And then the elders of the village said, Who is that preacher that they brought? Who? Meanwhile, the people are gone. The man is here. They said, You have to come back to the village and tell us where you go.